this IC107 that is on ocular trauma in pediatric age group. We have the privilege of having Dr. Nuzat Saudhari who will be having a keynote address on pain management during ROP screening following that particular talk. And uh, so, um, unfortunately, we too are only there. I would, in, uh, basically, a pediatric trauma involves more socioeconomic impact on a society compared to an injury which is happening later. And therefore, it is important that this has to be adequately and timely taken care by a specialist group of it and then we can prevent a blindness rather the comorbidities associated with it with this talk i think uh, the, we do not have dr mehul shah i would just run through me my presentation which is on management of iris trauma in children so over to me ma'am why don't you join us on that uh, yeah they are going to come but please there is nothing wrong in it okay <laughs> You be ready after my, I think we will have. Shall I begin? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, friends, I would be speaking on a uh, aspect why, why I have labeled my presentation forgotten is basically because this is the tissue which is most neglected in a case of a trauma. Whenever it is, there is a trauma, we repair a cornea, we repair a cataract, we do wonderful with your retina surgery, but most of the times when iris tissue comes to it, we excise it and make this patient, um, you know, having a deformed pupil. And this is because of a misplaced uh, conception about that iris tissue, if it is impacted into the wound, can lead to infection and sympathetic ophthalmia. And that is the reason why you see such deformed pupils and uh, sometimes even in a, a total an iridia in a post-trauma cases. So this is a video book where I'm going to share you how to repair an iris basically. And why is it important? Basically because it's not the um, uh, snail lens vision which is important. But remember, there are other components of vision which can be more disturbing to the patient, irritating to a patient in the form of glare, uh, glare photophobia. And most importantly, this trauma happens in a younger age group. And the beauty of a face lies in the eyes and the beauty of the eyes lies in the pupil and the iris diaphragm. And so cosmetically also the reconstruction of a pupillary diaphragm is equally important. So this is case number one. This is a patient who had undergone a traumatic uh, cataract surgery elsewhere. You hardly see any iris tissue. I thought there is a just from ten, uh, 1 o'clock to 10 o'clock you could see the iris tissue over here. We he patient was referred to us for scleral fixation of intraocular lenses we wanted to do scleral we of course did a scleral fixation of iol but we wanted to do more much more for this particular patient this is a video so now you will see this particular video only after i have done a scleral fixation because the topic here is iris so here i put a lot of viscoelastic deep in the anterior chamber use our vitreous forceps and try to retract the iris which is all uh, uh, retroverted and to my surprise, there was all 360 degree frill of iris. So that makes, oh, sorry. So that makes my job really relatively easy. So now, once I realize, I decide to do a fourth row knot pupilloplasty. So this is the iris tissue where I'm pulling it. I'm uh, reversing the retroflexion of it. Here I create a side ports at 10 and uh, 5, 5 and 7 o'clock meridian. And the railroaded suture is comes. This is a tenoproline suture which engages the iris at 7 o'clock meridian. And then it engages at 5 o'clock meridian. Here you see we are engaging the iris tissue. And following that the needle comes out from a 5 o'clock port. We create a loop and then the four throws are taken. Once you take a four throws over here you just have to pull the two external ends and here you have a descent construction of a pupillary diaphragm in the inferior quadrant. Same is repeated at superior meridian at 10 and 2 o'clock meridian and you can see the end result of it. So this patient not only had a good pseudophagic correction but we also had an iris pupillary diaphragm which was initiated. Sir Ajay on the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah. Okay, okay. So case number two, this is a case of a traumatic cataract with 180 degrees disinsertion of iris root. 
And so now here, yes, of course, we had to do a phaco emulsification with IOL, but preservation and creating of iris pupillary diaphragm was equally important. So here the video starts with a phaco emulsification steps ahead of phaco emulsification where you need to preserve the iris tissue while doing a phaco emulsification. Otherwise, it comes into the iris port and you chew off the available iris. So I use an iris hooks before doing a phaco emulsification and I get it out of the way of my active ports of the phaco emulsification. And once that is done, I have done a phaco emulsification. Sorry, it went ahead. So now once I have done the phaco emulsification, I put the lens, I dissect the conjunctiva, I clear, create a scleral tunnel over here at 9 o'clock meridian because there is where I am going to anchor the disinserted iris with a tenoproline suture. So this here goes the uh, tenoproline suture through the scleral tunnel, comes, in, engages the iris root and it goes back in a reverse way. And once I do that, I realize that the iris once root is inserted back rather anchored back at nine o'clock meridian i realized the whole pupil is drawn this this is not acceptable to me so i decide to do additionally a fourth row not pupilloplasty for this patient and once i do a fourth row not pupilloplasty for this patient you can realize what is the difference this is a patient pre-op and this is the post-op so this is the beauty of this iris repair you can really give him an iris pupillary diaphragm now case number three this is a case operated elsewhere this was a corneal scar this is the iris tissue which is available if you look iris tissue is available only up to this and this was a rolled swiss roll type of a iris tissue available so we intended to do phaco emulsification with iol but also we wanted to create an iris pupillary diaphragm that was our intention so this video again begins after having completed my phaco emulsification and you can see I, am, I, I have assessed how much is the iris tissue. Once I unroll it, I realize the iris tissue only exists up to 6 o'clock meridian. So first my job is to anchor this available iris at 6.30 6 o'clock meridian. And that's what I do. I created a, a, a scleral tunnel there about 1 to 1.5 millimeter behind. And then with a tenoproline suture the iris root is anchored back at 6 o'clock meridian, uh, 6 30 o'clock meridian. And once I anchor, I realize there is still a big iridodialysis cleft, uh, cleft rather I'm showing a defect. And so I need to anchor that part. I need to anchor there also. So there again, I anchor with a tenoproline suture. It goes to the main port. Again, it is being anchored. Now the challenge is this is the tissue which is not available to me. So what I need to do is if I have to construct a pupil, I decided to approximate the available iris tissue by doing a fourth row not pupilloplasty. So here I do a fourth row not pupilloplasty with a tenoproline suture. And once I do a fourth row not pupilloplasty, uh, yeah, you can see there is a big void of iris tissue, but I have constructed a pupil here. So now I need to anchor back the available iris tissue into the uh, sclera and this is what I'm trying to do and uh, this is the pre-op photograph of this particular patient and this is the post-op so I have not only put the lens back but we have created a iris we have created a pupillary diaphragm for this as well as you can see this is a one month post-op photograph of the same patient now case number four this is a patient who had undergone uh, he had a blunt injury he has a subluxated cataract a vitreous hemorrhage and uh, iris tissue loss was, was uh, our initial diagnosis. So we decide that we are going to do a vitreous procedure. But remember, whenever we do a vitreoretinal procedures, we use tamponades. If you use a tamponade like silicon oil and if there is no iris pup uh, pupillary diaphragm, it tends to migrate anteriorly and cause keratopathy and secondary glaucoma. And so is the importance of constructing a pupillary diaphragm. The only other way is to put an anchoring sutures, retention sutures with a tenoproline suture, but that is not that... Um, effective so this video you can see i have completed the lensectomy vitrectomy here and now i'm assessing how much is the iris luckily it was 270 degrees of iris root disinsertion the whole iris was crumpled in one clock uh, one few clock hours so now my job was relatively easy in this particular case so uh, i'm going to anchor at two or three clock hours at uh, two or three meridians and this is what I'm doing. First, I do it at 2.30 or 3 o'clock meridian. And once I do that, uh -huh. yeah. 
see so I'm anchoring over here this is the first suture which goes yeah tenoproline suture the anchoring of the iris root is being done at 230 o'clock meridian same thing is repeated then at 130 and 530 o'clock meridian and this is the pre-op so we have not only done for this particular patient lensectomy vitrectomy with endolaser and whatever procedures we have even put a scleral fixation of IOL as well as we have done constructed a pupillary diaphragm even, even in such a worst case this is a case of uh, I think this is not correlable over here but this is a case of a trauma uh, aniridia congenital aniridia remember in a congenital aniridia the commonest reason for poor vision is foveal hypoplasia the second commonest reason is the photophobia for this patient so you need to put an aniridia IOL in this particular case so what we do differently in an aniridia IOL in such cases is that we uh, anchor it like a scleral fixation so this is one of the cases now I would show you one of the live cases where we have done uh, this is a young baby which I was doing a pediatric IOL for this particular patient. So in spite of 25 years of experience sometimes you can cause an iatrogenic trauma to this patient. So I will begin the part I have completed the phaco emulsification and when I am trying to put the lens yeah, here the I am trying to introduce my three piece IOL and the, you can see an iris prolapse and in a hurry. I cause a rupture of the whole iris here so it was so uh, it really gave me a bad guilt uh, what was my thought process at that point I don't know I put the lens there and I needed to give this baby a small circular pupil so following that I did reconstruction of this pupil I have put back the lens and once I put a suture then the reconstruction is being done for this particular baby we did a for first we did uh, fourth row not pupilloplasty then we do an iris root anchoring and this is the end result of this particular baby so my guilt to some extent could be re reduced even in such cases when it happens so iris tissue needs to be preserved whenever there is a trauma at that point and leave it for a second setting when a particular repair can be done and you can create a decent iris pupillary diaphragm and so i always say Patients come to you for cataract, don't be happy just making him pseudo faking. You need to look beyond what will make him more ha having a more good quality of vision and definitely creating an iris pupillary diaphragm is needed and it should be done. That is what my uh, presentation is meant for. Thank you. Thank you for this. Now I request uh, our president of Ocular Trauma Society of India, Dr. Ashok Nogar, sir, to have his presentation. Good morning and uh, welcome to this session on pediatric trauma. The trauma in children is such an important issue because the, the morbidity that it leads to has a long term implication for their lives and handling it well there are several special considerations um, because uh, the tissues behave differently in children and the assessment problems issues of amblyopia and several other factors make it a very distinct difficulties in evaluation of visual acuity and several other factors make the trauma in children a special problem. So today we are de dealing with different aspects of pediatric ocular trauma and uh, I'm going to talk about or orbital and adnexal trauma in children. First of all, I'll talk about the orbital injury. The common <clears throat> distortion. So the common um, trauma that an oculoplastic surgeon needs to handle are the nasoorbitoethmoid fractures. The fractures that occur as a part of polytrauma with multiple injuries and the orbital floor fracture. So we look at some of these. The major complications that occur as a result of nasoorbitoethmoid fractures are traumatic telecanthus associated with nasolacrimal duct obstruction. 
Now, traumatic telecanthus like this is a very difficult problem to handle, especially when it becomes old and then it may require extensive repair, re revision of the scar, bone grafting, placement of a transnasal wiring or a wire fixation of the medial canthus in order to correct the telecanthus to a large extent. You can see the telecanthus has been improved upon by altering the bony anatomy there, removing the bone and we can improve the aesthetic appearance significantly. This was another patient with bilateral traumatic telecanthus due to nasoorbitoethmoid fracture with a chronic dacryocystitis which occurred due to simultaneous <coughs> nasolacrimal duct obstruction. We did a bicoronal approach with a plastic surgeon opening up the sacs and creating a open sky dacryocystorhinostomy along with a transnasal wiring for correction of telecanthus. You can see can achieve a much better appearance, a much deeper appearance of the uh, medial canthus with the help of transnasal wiring. Often the fractures in children are polytrauma, facial trauma with multiple bone involvement. One of the commonest associations is medial wall and floor fracture. So this was the patient with upward restriction of movement as you can see here and a restriction of inward movement as well and it was as, as we um, did a scanning a medial wall fracture associated with a floor fracture and this needs to be tackled by repairing both zmc fractures are another common fracture in these which may result in restriction of motility in several directions increase in orbital volume as you can see the resulting enophthalmos and hypophthalmos as there is a fracture at t three different places causing displacement of this entire fragment so this can be corrected by working to put those fragments back do a, a microplating with titanium plates and you can get a good rest restoration of orbital volume and ocular motility but the most common fractures that we tackle are the orbital floor fractures. The classical signs of ecchymosis, infraorbital hypoesthesia are associated with restriction of motility and enophthalmos and hypophthalmos. So a sinking back of the eye and a downward displacement are additional features. So proper assessment of the fracture by both the coronal cuts which show us the orbital anatomy and the fractures and the sagittal cuts which again give us the full extent of the fracture are important. You can see the amount of dipping that there is. So then they, these need to be tackled. The special consideration in children is that you get the so-called white-eyed fracture in these children of less than 18 years of age or these are green stick kind of fractures where the tissues get incarcerated and the bones come back. So diplopia with muscle or soft tissue entrapment. Now muscle entrapment can lead to a ocular cardiac reflex and it can be an emergency with lowering of pulse, nausea and other symptoms. And these need to be tackled as an emergency. So this is an example where you notice an upward restriction in the motility associated with uh, incarceration of a fragment while the bone has bounced back. So these then need to be tackled on an urgent basis, on an emergency basis to avoid complications. Subacute repairs are needed in, in cases where hypophthalmos or enophthalmos is a consideration and you wait for one to two weeks before you start the surgery. So the common approach used is the transconjunctival approach or a swinging eyelid approach where you're giving an incision below the tarsal plate, extending on to the lateral canthus and doing a canthotomy and cantholysis. And then you can tackle the different type of fractures, small fractures with very little incarceration of contents where nothing may needs to be done. These hairline fractures, 
where you may just need to remove the incarceration of tissue. As you can see here, this is the green stick type of fracture with just a small incarceration of tissue where by hand to hand, hand on hand maneuver, we are able to remove the incarceration, improve the motility and the forced action test and put in a small soft implant. Where you have larger incarcerations like this, you need more extensive maneuvers like this as we will see in this. We find this incarceration, we are releasing it by again using two instruments till we find all the edges of the, um, till you can find all the edges of the incarceration and you can then put a plate. So this is now the edge of the fracture that you can see and you can look at the entrum through that. This is the end point and sure that it has made the force duction test free. And then you can place an implant over that to cover the, all the ends of the defect. Green Example of a green stick orbital fracture or so called white eyed fracture in a child where there is an upward restriction as you can see here and you can see the incarceration of the contents here you can put in an implant and you can get a good correction with restoration of upward motility for enophthalmos and ocular motility restriction cases you need to ensure that all the incarceration is removed and volume is restored back so this is an example of a restoration uh, of, of in this case and after the repair you are able to get back correction of enophthalmos and correction of motility. Now one of the use, most useful methods is the use of titanium plates both in floor and medial wall. So this is a patient with significant enophthalmos and a downward displacement of globe where after repair of the floor you can see the defect here the plate here it must rest on the ledge at the back and must give a normal angulation to the medial wall so if you do those things you can get a good correction of the uh, enophthalmos now eyelid injuries are again common marginal repair is the most important technique that you need to know and restoration of the kenthai so here we see the technique of marginal repair where we are passing a suture first through the gray line. This is a 6-0 suture which is passed at the depth of about 3 millimeters comes back to the same side at a depth of 1 millimeter so that it is a vertical mattress suture. And when you tie it, it gives the wound a little pout which is what you want which when it contracts will give you a good level. So first suture being just posterior to gray line, a second suture closer to the posterior margin passed in a similar vertical mattress fashion, 3 millimeters from cut edge, 3 millimeter depth, coming back 1 millimeter from the cut edge, 1 millimeter depth and you are able to get a good restoration of the margin by passing a third suture which is closer to the lash line. And the, all the long ends left for the posterior sutures are then tied through the anterior most suture so that no suture ends will rub against the globe. You can then repair the tarsus with partial thickness vicryl sutures of 5-0 so that they don't rub against the globe and then do a skin closure. So because of a good rich vascular supply these heal very well and you get a good result. So if you have a defect which is larger you may need to replace tissues by either flaps or graft. Here we are using an advancement skin flap because this is the raw area and this defect can be covered. You also need to repair the medial canthus well. On the medial canthus you need to ensure attachment to the posterior lacrimal crest behind the sac. On the lateral side you need to ensure when you do a lateral canthal repair that you attach it to the periorbita 
behind the orbital margin and then come out by double arm sutures in front of the margin. So those will ensure a good anchorage of canthi. Cicatricial ectropion like this in children where uh, because of trauma up and down you can you need to replace the lost skin here in the upper lid we can do it by a y to v v to y plasty and in the lower lid by a skin graft so the principle of a v to y plasty is that you are trying to lengthen this area which is shortened by giving an incision like a v which is then undermined to free it from all the underlying scar. Once you have done this scar removal and ensured that the, uh, nat the uh, contracture being caused by it is taken care of, you can then cover the gap that you have here by mobilization of tissues from the two sides. So essentially you are using up the horizontal excess of tissue to give you a vertical correction. So this V will then be closed like a Y and it will give you a good correction of the ectropion. You can already see that the margin is in position already and the ectropion has been taken care of. So this is an example of a VY plasty with for the upper lid and skin grafting for the lower lid and we've been able to correct this severe ectropion by the replacement of skin tissue. Full thickness grafts like this for ectropion may be needed. We can see the result after a skin graft. Lastly, we'll cover the canalicular injuries. The canalicular injuries may occur due to direct penetrating trauma or most often due to indirect trauma, which may be due to a, a, um, violence or due to a road accident commonly. Now, the children and young adults are involved more commonly or blouse hooks in young infants and birth trauma is another factor. So sometimes these can be relatively occult and you have to have a high index of suspicion to look for them. The obvious ones are easy. The occult ones like this may be missed and you must suspect them and look for them and then you'll be able to find these. So you must treat them to avoid a persistent epiphora which avoids an abnormal appearance of the canthus as well which is also important besides taking care of the epiphora. Lower is the more commonly involved canal canaliculus and even the lower and the upper all must be repaired. Um, it is important not to leave it unrepaired even if it is upper canaliculus and it is best to repair them within 24 to 48 hours but if you still repair within five days you can be successful. So principles of canalicular repair are that you must identify the curtains, approximate them by and then place a stent in position because unless the stent remains in position for a period of six weeks, there will be scarring and the effort made at joining the canaliculus will be wasted. You can use local anesthesia in cooperative adults, but in children, general anesthesia is usually used. So the most difficult part usually is the localization of the medial cut end which can be done if you look under good illumination and high magnification working under microscopes hel helps and you are able to see the shiny white cuff area when you pass a probe with normal anatomical orientation you'll find the inner end will come and reach a place where you can localize this but in difficult cases where the cut is more medial you can inject air from the opposite side put a little pressure on the sac region a 10 ml syringe is used with air. You can put a pool of water here and when you inject air with sac being blocked, you can see the air emerge from the medial cut end. And if you can't immediately see it, pass a suture anterior to anteriorly and lift it up and then you will be able to see the medial cut end and you can then easily pass your probe. Dye can be used from the opposite punctum or pigtail probes can be used. 
Now, the most commonly used material is mini monaca stent, but where it is not available, the silicon self retaining mini monaca, you can use bicanalicular intubation or, use, or even a simple intracath, the 24 gauge or 22 gauge intracath, which is made of Teflon, <coughs> is used. Now, essentially what is needed is pericanaricular suturing and we look at the videos. But simpler technique with just use one or two sutures also work. So, we'll just go through this brief video. Uh, here we are using a Teflon intracath if you do not have a mini monarch, although that is the material of choice. So, we are giving a single snip through the canaliculus in order to pass the Tube. Now this has a support, we have just removed the needle, sharp needle part of it and we've located the medial end and we are going through and when we reach the hard stop at the bone, we, we know we are in right position. Then all that you need to do is pass sutures around, three or four sutures in the tissues around the canaliculus, not going through the wall to ensure that there is good repair and then do a marginal repair. So that alone is enough and then of course a good marginal repair is important and you will remove the, the supporting uh, needle within this and leave this Teflon tube here and fixate it to the eyelid. So this is the marginal repair that is being done as by the technique that we discussed. And then this tube that is left is fixated to the eyelid tissue in order to maintain it in position. Um, mini monaca is a self-retaining material which is most helpful. So we are passing a mini monaca here after we have located the medial cut end. Given a little snip, we pass the mini monaca which can then be self-retaining because of the knob that it has. This knob can go into the punctum and ensure that it stays in position. So the canalicular tears can be repaired very satisfactorily with results which are nearly 95 to 97 percent and complications are very rare. Thank you very much. Thank you sir and uh, we assured uh, all sorts of difficult scenarios uh, which needs to be handled really with great care. Uh, sir, uh, what is the, uh, what do you think is the uh, risk of, uh, uh, you know, closure of these uh, canaliculi by fibrosis after you have removed the stent? Okay. Thank you, sir. And now we move on to the next speaker. We have Dr. S. Natarajan who will be talking about management of posterior segment trauma in children. Thank you, Rajesh, for taking over the chair. So the ocular trauma is the main cause of damage to children's vision. Incidence is one in a thousand in the developing countries. Posterior segment trauma in pediatrics has particular features, carries unique implications unlike those in the adults. And the critical history associated with the injury may be difficult to obtain. Examination of the patient is almost always challenging and pediatric ocular trauma if often involved in the posterior segment of the eye accompanied by multiple tissue damage, irreversible damage to visual function. So I am giving a case history of a 15 year old male presented to us on 7th February with a complaint of blindness in the superior half of vision for two days in the right eye. Had fell down while playing cricket at college sports day on 5th February 2023. And this is the diagnosis with the old partial regmatogenous retinal detachment with a break on the uh, temporal uh, side and we also have demarcation lines showing that it is a old retinal detachment. Only when the macula was involved, he actually saw that the retinal detachment was uh, 
uh, happening. And this is, you can see the subretinal bands indicating it's a old retinal detachment. That's the problem with children. One, when the injury happens, they don't tell the uh, parents because of the fear of punishment. And also, we, uh, the parents don't take the children for annual checkups uh, periodically. But the vision was 6-9, only because of the upper half of vision, where the macula was involved, the child was uh, complaining. And that's the uh, pre-op uh, macula. And that's the surgery where I did perform the serial buckling surgery, which is uh, very important in a young uh, uh, may, uh, a boy like this because there's no PVD in young children. So scleral buckling is a uh, fine art of uh, retinal surgery, which is what, uh, even though it's a misnomer, the entire surgery is done on the sclera and uh, we reattach the retina by draining from the external. So the, the steps are to uh, attack the muscles and I use uh, white sutures for the vertical muscles and black sutures for the horizontal muscles so that you can uh, turn the eye well and protect the cornea while doing. So the tissue care is very important so that uh, you don't have the complications like a squint falling uh, a scleral buckling surgery and that's what I am doing for almost uh, four decades now and you can see the, ret scleral the retinal tear is marked with the diathermy and then I use this bob method to put the scleral suture, place the well, uh, the uh, scleral sutures first and then uh, uh, make a loose knot and then I pass the 240 band all through uh, and then the buckle will be placed after the uh, drainage. So here I make a, 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 a scleral flap called a belt uh, buckle I do where we use the hockey stick knife to make the uh, loop and it's like a belt loop so you pass through all the muscles and then uh, beneath the muscles and then in all quadrants anterior to the equator and posterior to the, mu the muscle ring which will represent the ora serrata so that you have a artificial ora serrata created to support the periphery of the retina and uh, all the things are done without sutures and then even the, uh, uh, the final band tie is done with the Watsky sleeve which is again a silicon sleeve so that you don't see any have sutures except that one buckle even buckle you can place it with a flap but there's a risk of perforation because you have to make a large uh, uh, a flap and here I'm actually like the trabeclectomy I make a scleral flap and then uh, exposing the chorite so that I don't have to have a full thickness uh, a scleral flap to open the, for making the uh, scleral, the, the SRF drainage. So here I make a fine needle and you can see the subretinal fluid is being drained. And uh, this is the best to, so that you don't touch the vitreous at all when we are doing the surgery. And I use a buckle, tighten it moderately and use the non-expansile SF6 air combination so that it will support the uh, break and also make up the volume of the eye. So you don't tighten it high, you recheck the optic disc, the scleral buckle height so that uh, they don't develop high myopia because of that. So the volume is made with the, as I said, the non expansion gas. In case you have a complication at the uh, perforation site, you can do the cryo. So this is what I'm doing after checking and then placing the buckle and tightening the uh, encircling band. So you check the bar height and then finally tighten and make the uh, final knot. And then in case the pressure is high, you can do a paracentesis to make sure the intraocular pressure is maintained at the conclusion of surgery. So you finally trim the uh, buckle and then make sure it is covered well by the tenons and the uh, conjunctiva. And I usually use the the glue to do the so that there's no irritation post-operatively and no need for uh, suture removal and particularly young kids you may need even a GA to remove the suture removal here the sutures are not there so there's no suture removal and buckle is most of the time you don't have to do anything and this is the uh, glue uh, I, we use the solution A and B so that uh, you finally close the conjunctiva and also give a subconjunctival antibiotic injection to because of the elastic material used while the surgery and this is how you close the wound and most of the time well, after a few months you don't make out the eye is operated so that's mainly depending on the how you handle and this is the intraoperative pictures and the postoperative there's a small pocket of microfluid at the fovea which will get absorbed 
is another uh, 12 year old male with a 636 with a traumatic retinal detachment you can again see old inferior retinal detachment and there's a tear at six o'clock which usually uh, i'm analyzing the cricket ball injury may mainly because either the rubber ball or even the regular cricket ball when it bounces it hits the lower part of the eye and then the bell's phenomenon the eye goes up and then the bar, exactly at six o'clock you have a tear many times they don't give history because uh, they are afraid or they have really forgotten so you can see the subretinal band and then the bands are going around the macula and temporally and you see the OCT showing the subretinal fluid almost nearing the macula so similar procedure done the so you can fast forward So any similar uh, scler sclera, the same tagging the muscle. Is it possible to fast forward? The no, okay, no problem. Anyway, I think the similar procedure. So this is the post-operative fundus picture. Retina is totally attached, and then uh, so the idea is uh, you can do a every surgery need not do a vitreoretinal surgery, but uh, in uh, retinal detachment in children, a scleral buckling is the best procedure, and you should have a pro appropriate uh, height created so that. The uh, artificial myopia is not induced in children. And in case I had a, a, a patient who had undergone somewhere still buckling when you were, when the boy when the child was uh, uh, three or four years old and then came at uh, 15 years with a high myopia, I released the buckle or removed the buckle, and that time probably the myopia can be reduced because the hourglass appearance you should avoid. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so just one question for you. In which conditions would you like to do primary VR surgery in these traumatic retinal detachment in children? And when you have a giant retinal tear uh -huh. and all the, or a macular hole, a traumatic macular hole or PVR. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And you have to excuse me for the next session. So Dr. Rajesh Shinda is the head of the cornea in the uh, All India Institute and request him to chair and also give his talk. Thank you, Rajesh. So, uh, I've been talking about the attic, uh, corneal trauma, and uh, we all know that uh, uh, trauma in children is very often seen in school going age group, and it, it accounts for about 8 to 14 percent of total childhood injuries. It can be blunt, penetrating, it can be all sorts of trauma. This is one study which we published long back, I think it was in the year. 2002, yes, and wherein we uh, did a study on the prevalence of trauma, the causes of uh, pediatric trauma uh, over a period of uh, uh, six to eight months. And we found out that unsupervised sports was the uh, most common cause for uh, uh, pediatric ocular trauma. And injury by household items like pencil, pen, knife, Particularly, uh, many times in the festival season in India, particularly the study was done in North India. So in the later half of the year, there's festival season, the Sahara and Diwali and all that. So there, the uh, bow and arrow injury is also quite common because children like to play with uh, bow and arrow during that period. And uh, you can have all sorts of uh, corneal injury. You can have corneal abrasion, you can have perforation, there can be corneal foreign body, there can be chemical injury. and Abrasion causes a lot of pain because cornea is highly innervated. So uh, it has to be handled uh, immediately. It's, it's sort of an emergency. So you have to treat the patient with lubricants, patching, antibiotics, etc. And uh, explain to the parents. If there's a corneal laceration, it has to be repaired. And laceration and perforations represent about 6.8% to 14% of ocular traumatic injury. And uh, the goal of management is to have a proper watertight globe and maintain globe integrity. Uh, if you have a partial thickness laceration, then in that case, uh, uh, what you can do is, uh, if it's, a, if it's uh, opposed, then in an adult, you can still leave it. But in children, it's better to put a suture. And if it's slightly avulsed, in any case, you have to put the suture to oppose the tissue. The surgery is uh, performed under general anesthesia in vast majority. Sometimes because of uh, multiple injuries, uh, if the patient is not
fit for general anesthesia then you may have to uh, resort to uh, you know topical anesthesia and do a small if it's a small perforation you can do without touching the globe if you have an adnexal injury a uh, lot of thing these things were discussed by dr grover if you have an adnexal injury along with corneal injury first the corneal injury should be uh, repaired and then only adnexal injury should be done and as far as uh, corneal repair is concerned teno monofilament tylon is uh, is the suture that is used and uh, close to 90% of thickness uh, we have to take the throw and uh, when you have a perforation like this then in such cases first and foremost is whenever you have a corneal uh, perforation the first and foremost thing is to oppose the limbus because here you get the white line and and you oppose the white line so that's the best landmark to have a proper opposition and then you go ahead and uh, uh, do the suture Now, in a vertical laceration the entry and exit point of suture should be equidistant from the laceration so this is what it is if it's a vertical laceration both these should be equal but if it's a shelved kind of a thing in such a case uh, uh, the uh, entry and exit point of the suture on the posterior surface should be equidistant so that is what uh, is important and in terms of number of sutures uh, what you have to see is that whenever you are putting one suture and the other here so the triangle of compression should be attached to each other so this point is attaching so this means that the distance between the two suture is uh, adequate and if you have a full corneal uh, perforation in that case uh, the central part in the central part you put smaller bites and in the peripheral part you put a larger bite and in angular perforation the angle has to be opposed first and in a stellet perforation you may pass a first string suture otherwise there can be overriding of tissue and uh, the configuration may not be that great as you can see here an example of a full corneal perforation so the peripheral bites are larger and the central bites are smaller and whenever there is a corneal scleral perforation as i said the golden rule is lcs so limbus has to be opposed first then cornea and sclera and if there is a prolapsed iris in such cases if it's more than uh, 36 hours uh, old then you may have to do partial uh, iris abscission so that the superficial layer that is uh, exposed should be removed otherwise there's risk of infection and then you can, you should in all these cases you should inject intracameral antibiotics uh, this is a case where in a corneal perforation is there with a the uveal prolapse so whenever we are repairing we make a paracentesis in a separate area inject viscoelastic and then separate the uveal tissue by going through this paracentesis and not through the perforation and once the uveal tissue is separated we can go ahead and pass suture so it's a small perforation you can uh, start with a uh, single suture in the center and then you can put two sutures in the periphery and then you can keep bisecting so that is the basic idea and then in the end you ensure that the uh, tissues are well opposed a case of a corneal scleral perforation you can see this white line so we can always oppose this white line that's why limbus is preferred as the first uh, area of suturing you remove all this uh, muck all the slough tissue has to be removed make a small paracentesis inject some viscoelastic from there and then as you can see the first suture is at the limbus and once you have passed the limbus suture you can uh, Uh, replace uh, the prolapsing uveal tissue and then uh, you pass one suture in one at one corner then a, another suture at another corner in the cornea and then you bisect it then you bisect in between these sutures similarly you bisect in between so that is how you keep bisecting and you complete the procedure uh if there's a tissue loss in such a case uh, we should not try to oppose the corneal tissue by forming any folds or causing any uh, uh, bend in the uh, cornea otherwise it will just go into thysis so if there is any tissue loss it's better to uh, repair it uh, if it's a small tissue loss you can put fibrin glue you can put cyanoacrylate glue along with bandage contact lens 
one can also put amniotic membrane transplant but if it's a slightly larger tissue loss we can always do a patch graft and once the repair has been done uh, in children it's always better to put a shield so that they don't rub the eyes and there's no damage to the eye so that uh, the repair remains proper and you can see if you have a corneal, a corneal repair like this and uh, the lens has also been removed in such cases you get a very dense scar in such dense scars visual rehabilitation by spectacles is not possible so in such cases visual rehabilitation by rgp contact lens is a good option in order to improve the uh, outcome of the uh, repair as far as uh, chemical injury is concerned immediate management should be done in order to prevent uh, damage in order to minimize damage and uh, the first thing is to do proper irrigation so that uh, uh, you remove the chemical so when you are doing this it should be done thoroughly so in order to have cooperation you can put some amount of uh, paracaine and then you keep uh, 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 then you keep uh, washing it with uh, fluid you word the lid and then you wash and then in the end once you have done the washing completely wait for 5 minutes and then check the ph and if the ph is close to 7 this means that there is no more chemical left there but you should wait for 5 minutes otherwise immediately if you do it will take the ph of the irrigating fluid that you have used and uh, double immersion uh, to remove the chemical from uh, uh, any calde sac is uh, important because sometimes it can uh, remain there and can remain stuck and then uh, once you have washed it thoroughly you have to promote epithelialization for that you have to assess the damage in the cornea as well as in the limbus and uh, how much is the limbal ischemia how much is the corneal uh, um, staining and then you debride the necrotic material you have to give analgesic topical antibiotic topical steroid is important and lubrication and uh, sodium ascorbate is a good uh, thing you can put it topically as well as systemically so as to improve collagen synthesis sodium citrate helps it acts as a chelating agent and uh, sometimes you can have embedded uh, uh, particulate matter which uh, you would like to remove uh, by doing dissection so uh, because if there is any chemical uh, particularly alkaline uh, element Uh, underneath the conjunctiva then it will cause scleral melt so if you find it out then th there's no harm in doing uh, conjunctival dissection and removal of the uh, particulate matter and once you have done it you can put an amniotic membrane amniotic membrane transplantation is very useful in these cases because it not only promotes epithelialization it uh, reduces pain as well as uh, uh, it improves healing and it should be done on the whole of surface whole of the cornea the bulba conjunctiva and the palpebral conjunctiva so that the uh, pain and epithelial healing is promoted significantly this is how it looks like in the case of a chemical injury i'm not even brain transplantation resulting in full healing this is one study which uh, we had published regarding the role of amniotic membrane in acute chemical burn so in conclusion ocular trauma is very common in children and particularly in uh, school going age group and unsupervised sports it can be in, with inside home it can be outside uh, these are important factors that uh, that can cause ocular trauma we have to do prompt and meticulous management in these cases and since the child has a long life so we have to be very prompt and active and uh, we have to explain to the parents that management may require multiple interventions and they have to be ready for that so thank you very much for your patient listening any question uh, i'll be uh, happy to answer uh, uh if there's no question then i would like to invite our keynote uh, addressee the dr nuzat chaudhary she will be uh, giving keynote lecture on pain management during rop screening yeah please
Uh, uh, see, in uh, trauma cases, it again depends. Like, uh, if you have a small central perforation, uh, if you can manage with cyanoacrylate glue, it is freely available. You don't have to do any uh, dissection to take out the tenons because all the area is inflamed. No, so uh, a minimal manipulation because patient is also not cooperative. So uh, you can manage with cyanoacrylate glue. Another option is yes, you can take tenons. You can take tenons from the other eye as well, and uh, that is also a good option. But if it's a larger one, then you have to do a proper corneal patch graft. Hello, sir. Good morning. Just switch on. Yeah, yeah. The other one also. The other one also. Oh, okay. Uh, so among all the pediatric group, I think the neonates are the most vulnerable, and an often neglected side of their treatment is the pain management during ROP screening. We know that we do the screening in the most vulnerable. They are the less than 35 weaker and less than 2,000 gram. It is a painful procedure, even if it's a small few seconds takes, it takes to us for do the, to do the screening. We do use eyelid speculum, scleral indentation, manipulation of the globe and bright light makes it quite dis, uh, a painful procedure for the children. But the tragedy is that we are blissfully unaware of the pain that we are causing to them. Uh, we, um, the, there are certain myths and certain preconceptions in our mind that, they are that these preterm infants are less sensitive to pain than adults and they have no memory of the pain. There is no long-term sequelae and they uh, we are also worried about the effects of analgesia on them. But the fact is by late gestation a fetus develops them anatomic, neurophysiologic and hormonal component to perceive pain and actually the preterms are most vulnerable uh, than their full-term counterparts to, uh, to pain and stressful procedures because particularly they have underdeveloped pain, pain inhibitory pathway. Uh, but we are subjecting them repeatedly to these painful procedures and till date there is no universal approach to neonatal pain assessment and management. The physiologic acute effects of pain are very obvious to see. There's shallow respiration, decrease, increase in heart rate, increase in blood pressure, increase in intracranial pressure. There is a shrill cry, decreased vagal nerve tone, a piece of the bradycardia, even apnea, and it can turn fatal even. But long-term effects are frequently overlooked. If the pain sensation, pain is, stimuli is prolonged and sustained and significant, it can actually alter the cerebral neuroanatomy, leading to poor cognitive outcome, motor outcome, delayed uh, development, uh, impaired behavioral de development, growth impairment. And these children, when they grow up, they have altered pain perception. They're less tolerant to pain. So um, um, uh, my colleague, Dr. Tariq, had a presented here in the past uh, conference about such a um, um, research by us where we have shown episodes of apnea, bradycardia, and tachycardia even happening during screening. So there are a plethora of literature out there on pain management and assessment, yet we do not follow them actually, and we are not very aware during the screening. So a good one is no, by Norina Witt et al. And it has given a complete guide the actual truth is that there is validated pain scales to measure, actually measure pain in neonates, uh, and they're validated and good ones. These facial expressions we're all aware of, and these expressions are through which the uh, scale, validated scales are formed, and we can use them. There's also non-pharmacological methods and pharmacological methods by which we can reduce the pain. And this particular um, article has proposed a tiered approach to analgesia in case of neonates. Another systematic review, which reviewed a number of, a large number of articles, um, has come to a recommendation that it, it is better, it would be wise to incorporate pre-procedural oral paracetamol with intra-procedure topical anesthesia um, with pro-oximetacaine. And that could be combined with non-pharmacological measures like swaddling, nestling, and oral sugar. Uh, oral sugar solution like 10% dextrose or glucose. But this finding actually 
is uh, contradictory to what we have found in our Bangabundu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. We have do done a double-blinded randomized control trial, trial. It was done by Rumpa Chaudhary, a neonatologist, with uh, patients from Dr. Tariq and Dr. Me at my uh, ROP clinic. Uh, and uh, they, uh, it, 60 patients were seen. And uh, in this um, study, we have taken randomly three groups of uh, neonates. One was given nestling and swaddling only, group A. Others were given express breast milk, uh, two of uh, two millimeter, two minutes prior to the procedure. And the other group was given syrup paracetamol, 30 minutes prior to the procedure at the dosage of 15 milligram per kg along with breast milk. And then we, um, then we were, uh, did the screening, heart rate oxygen saturation by the pulse oximeter was recorded and the whole procedure was re uh, video recorded. Then another researcher who was blinded about the procedure scaled the pain sensation according to the um, uh, PIPP scale. And this scale had three, it was done 20 seconds prior to the procedure, during the procedure, and two minutes after the procedure. And pain was graded as mild, moderate, severe, severe being the score more than 12. And you can find, like, such a video was, um, you know, um, taken, and the grader independently graded the, um, independently graded the, uh, no. Uh, the yeah. scream, mm -hmm. the facial expression of the child, and also the heart rate and pulse yeah. oximeter yeah. 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 Rec yeah. recordings yeah. Okay. were also um, uh, yeah. taken into account, and through the PIPP scale, pain of this child was measured by an Indi by a researcher who was blinded by the procedure, and the statistical analysis was done. So we can see that uh, you know twenty. Seconds prior to the procedure, pain is um, not that much, uh, obviously. But during the procedure, pain is 16, 14, 13, so it's severe. And 20, uh, two minutes after the procedure, pain is still there. It's moderate, but it is still there. So it's, uh, the PIPP2 level is significantly high. And we, when we compare between the different groups, we find that uh, these modalities have significant effect on reducing the pain. But what we found is that See, there are the, uh, from our study, we found that there is uh, ROP screening causes significant pain with persistent residual pain even after the procedure in the premature neonates. Breast milk alone or in combination with acetaminophen, paracetamol can reduce significant pain um, uh, more than that, uh, that group which only received non-pharmacological like cradling and nesting. But none of these groups gave sufficient relief to the severe pain during the procedure. This is what we found. And this, uh, this article by Ramna Nayak, this research, actually co uh, supports our finding where they have compared breast milk, 10% dextrose, and sterile water. They have found that all these modalities have analgesic effect, and they have similar analgesic effect, but they do not significantly alleviate pain during the procedure. So my take home message is that we need to appreciate more the amount of stress and pain that we are causing to the neonates during screening and our finding finds it to be of severe scale. And there is a need for consensus of an universal approach to pain management in our neonates during uh, ROP screening. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. It's uh, a really very pertinent issue and uh, something which we all should uh, look into and uh, emphasize. Thank you very Th much. Thanks a lot. Yeah. 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 It's actually in, um, done in collaboration with us in the neonatology department. Uh, uh, the video was actually assessed for the PIPP scale by a, a researcher who was blinded by the whole procedure. So yes, it's um, she has done a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So with this, we conclude the session and. Uh, I would like to thank all the speakers and uh, all of our, all the colleagues who uh, 
were here in the uh, session thanks a lot